if I can also start by paying my respects uh, to the elders of the Aora Nation, the Gadigal people, including uh, Uncle Ray Davidson. And thank you very much for inviting me and thank you for those kind words. I'm not going to speak for very long. My, uh, my role, I guess, is just to set the scene for today <laughs> and to uh, maybe take as little time as possible so that we can start hearing from the real speakers who I'm personally looking forward to hearing from myself. But just in, as part of setting that scene, um, just to say a little bit about why uh, the brain science, if you like, is so important to us in our jobs in the children's court on a daily basis. As Andrew explained, the children's court is responsible for all youth crime or, or all youth offenders in the state as well as all the care and protection matters. And the brain science is relevant to both sides of, those juris of that jurisdiction. Um, so far as uh, there are two separate jurisdictions, there is a distinct correlation between a history of care and protection interventions and future criminal offending. We know that there's about a 40% uh, crossover between the two jurisdictions, as it's been explained by uh, Dr. Judy Cashmore, who's an eminent uh, um, researcher and academic in this area, and has established that there is a, um, a link between childhood maltreatment and subsequent offending, particularly in adolescence. So the brain science, as I say, is very important to us. Uh, and it's only something that I think we as judicial officers are starting to understand and appreciate and to apply in our day-to-day -day adjudications. We call those kids crossover kids. The Children's Court itself is one of the oldest children's courts in the world and it's a, it's a specially created standalone jurisdiction which has its origins traced back to 1850. So I like to tell people that in the First Fleet, for example, there were a number of children amongst the convicts that were exported to New South Wales and they were under 18. And the interesting thing about that is they weren't treated as children, they were just treated as adults. So we've come actually some way <laughs> since we started in New South Wales towards differentiating between children and adults. But I suspect we're going to learn today that we've got a lot further to go and a lot more to do in this area. Unfortunately, whilst New South Wales, I think at the moment, is going forwards, Victoria is going backwards. Uh, and I'm not going to say too much about what's going on in Victoria, but they're winding back a lot of the reforms that they've achieved in the last 150 years in that state by closing down their detention centres and taking away jurisdiction from the Children's Court. And it's my thesis that the importance of the Children's Court as a separate, discrete jurisdiction is highly important if we're going to look after our children properly. Uh, as President, I've had the opportunity to, as Andrew said, preside over a wide range of cases, but also to involve myself in um, the wider protection system for children. I've visited all the detention centres, and you'll be pleased to know that in the last five years, corresponding with my period as the President, for which I can't take the credit, we've closed out three of our ten detention centres, so we've only got seven to go. <laughs> Um, the juvenile population in detention has decreased by about a third and that's due to a range of factors but I suspect one of them is going to be because of our increasing knowledge of the brain development, particularly the adolescent brain, uh, and we're starting to address those sorts of issues as part of our daily work. Um, I also think that uh, other organisations like the police and juvenile justice are starting to use this modern learning and they're starting to apply a much more enlightened approach to the treatment of children particularly children who are committing crimes. So in particular, the need for ongoing collaboration between the scientific, political and legal communities is absolutely crucial as the ability of judicial officers to understand and make decisions in the best interests of children relies heavily on our ability to understand the social, emotional and psychological development of children and to be able to identify areas for prevention early intervention, diversion and rehabilitation. I'm not going to go into the detail of the research, which would be much better left to the speakers following me, but what I can say is that it's becoming abundantly clear that although adolescents appear to function in much the same way as adults, they really are not capable of the executive function that mature adults possess. This means that young people cannot be treated as mini-adults, mini as they sometimes are in the court system, and I believe that brain science justifies a unique response from the criminal justice and child welfare systems towards dealing with young people. 
So um, I look forward to hearing the discussions this morning. There are, if I can just express a note of caution, two what we call two new cohorts of young offenders that are really starting to trouble me. And they are, first of all, the radicalisation of young people. We're seeing more and more of that. I'll be very interested to see if the brain science can help us to understand that particular phenomenon. That's a phenomenon that I think we need to learn a lot more about before we can start finding what the right answer is for dealing with those children. I suspect at the end of the day, it is just another function of the brain development uh, and I'm hoping that that's the case and that we'll find ways of dealing with those sorts of issues in an enlightened way. The second uh, cohort is what we call performative offenders. That's a tag which is being used in Victoria to explain this phenomenon of these users that are going around in gangs, breaking into houses and stealing car keys and going on rampages and driving cars at a fast rate through the city. And we think that a lot of that's being driven by the adolescent need for attention seeking, um, acting impulsively. I hope so. I hope that again is just another function of the juvenile brain that we can ultimately address uh, in the same way as we have with our traditional offenders. And I think in that sense, social media probably plays a big part because all they're trying to do is to get attention. And to that extent, the press has its own responsibilities in this regard. The, I recall the episode out at uh, one of our detention centres where the kids got on the, on the roof and they were there for a couple of hours and they'd done a bit of damage. And it was getting cold, it was getting dark, and they were about to come down until the helicopter arrived. <laughs> Put the spotlight on them, so they stayed there for another two hours and totally destroyed the building. So I think that uh, there is another element in this uh, of attention seeking, and the press, I think, has to take some responsibility in this regard for ensuring that they don't encourage uh, uh, and facilitate this sort of behaviour. Anyway, enough from me because I'm really only here to set the scene. Looking forward to some very interesting discussion about brain development and I'm sure we'll have a very interesting day. Thank you.